We know a whole lot about Ozempic, Wagovi, GLP-1 receptor agonists. We know how they work, but where we have some questions is what happens after they work? What's happening in the brain? What's actually making us not want to eat? We know the simple input-output, that if something binds to a GLP-1 receptor, it's gonna make us not wanna eat. But what about the neuropsychology there? What about the neurotransmitter? What's actually happening in the brain? Because if we understand this portion, then maybe we can sort of manipulate appetite a little bit more without the use of these things. Now, after this video, I put a link down below for 40% off Sundays. Now, I have four dogs. I'll tell you, we feed them Sundays because it's human grade dog food. So that means it's good quality food that a human could eat themselves. You might be wondering, this is really random to have a commercial for dog food on a health channel. Bottom line is, this channel is also about my life and I talk about things that I use and that's how sponsors come on this channel. So that is a 40% off discount for Sunday's human grade dog food. It was formulated by a veterinarian that really saw a serious need to feed higher quality food to our dogs. So that link down below gets you 40% off if you've got pups and you care about health, it's probably an interesting fit. Check them out down below. So first, a little bit of understanding of how the brain works really quick. There's this area of the brain called the dorsal vagal complex. We'll just call it the DVC. All you really need to know about the DVC is that the DVC receives signals from a lot of different things, but one of the things in this context, it receives signals from food intake. Now the DVC has what are called clusters of neurons that will project into other regions of the brain to facilitate how we respond to things. So like if we eat something and it signals these responses in the DVC, then the DVC can project signals out into other areas of the brain that make us act on them, like go to the pantry and eat more food, or feel like, you know what, I don't really feel like I need to eat. It's all happening behind the scenes, behind the curtains up here, because all we know is our conscious life and what we're thinking but there's actually some stuff happening there. Now, the DVC is also notorious for having GLP-1 receptors, as well as leptin receptors, and some other receptors that have to do with food and hunger and satiety. And for the longest time, researchers thought these to be highly glutamatergic. They were only looking at one side of the equation. So this new study is looking at what is called GABA, gamma aminobutyric acid. And these are clusters that are in this portion of the brain that might actually regulate energy homeostasis, like our need to eat, our desire to eat. We get a signal that goes to the DVC, and then the DVC sends the signals out to the brain. But we haven't really understood what is causing these signals. Because then in another portion of our brain that you might know of, it's called the hypothalamus. It's a very important decision-making area. And what that can do is that has a rexogenic which makes you want to eat more, and you have anorexogenic, which makes you want to eat less. If these get activated a certain way, it's gonna make you hungry or make you not hungry. And again, it's seemingly out of our control. We might now understand what's happening with the neurotransmitters after the fact. Like what's actually causing our mental decision to not eat as much. So I'm gonna read you a quote from the researchers on this new paper. We hypothesize that GABA neurons significantly regulate feeding and body weight and project to and inhibit key food intake stimulating cells. What that tells us in a very simple sense is that indirectly, GLP-1s are actually influencing GABA to go where it needs to go. So then it kind of begs the question, well, how do we increase our levels of GABA without using Ozempic? If you don't have enough GABA, then A, GLP-1s might not even work as well, but B, like if you have enough GABA on hand, then maybe you can get by without having to take Ozempic because you could actually eat and have a stronger signal coming from food. When you eat fiber, protein, or allulose, you produce a lot of GLP-1 with these foods. Okay, and then when these GLP-1s are increased, then they go bind to the receptor. When we use Ozempic, we are using a, a compound that is like GLP-1. It is an agonist, so it activates the receptor just like the food would trigger. But if you're sensitive enough where your food is actually able to send the right signal, you shouldn't need that, right? That's the difference between people that overeat and people that have portion control. And we've known for a long time that a lot of this is neuropsychological and neurochemical, but now we're getting a clearer picture. So here's some of the things that you can do. If you have poor gut health, you deplete glutamine because glutamine is required to repair and replenish the cells that are in our gut. So a perfect example that's in an extreme case 
is an athlete, like an endurance athlete that runs a lot and is moving a lot, they are actually breaking down a lot of their gut barrier and they deplete glutamine because glutamine has to be used in that little system to replenish and repair the gut. Very widely documented, it's very real that glutamine helps support that gut barrier integrity. It's not just during exercise, it's during stress or during illness. Okay, so I'm not saying everyone needs to supplement with glutamine. What I'm enforcing here is the importance of our gut health and how if our gut health is bad, then more of our glutamine is used up in the gut, which means we have less glutamine to support glutamate, which means we have less ability to produce GABA, which means we start getting hungry. Maybe now we have an indirect reason as to why we get so hungry when we go through bouts of stress. Glutamine is a way that you can replenish that and it's dirt cheap. I don't have any affiliation whatsoever with a glutamine company. In no way, shape, or form am I saying that because you can go on Amazon and get it for like $5. I don't recommend everyone takes it. I recommend you take it when you're increasing your exercise intensity or when you're working out more or when you're extra stressed or maybe after you've been sick. But I think people have the wrong idea with gut health. It's not just about fiber. It's usually about stress. It's usually about the microbiome. It's usually about the consumption of trans fats. It's usually about giving your gut a break from food every now and then. That's where I do believe that having breaks in between meals, conscious breaks, are not just good for weight loss and control that way. They're good because they allow the gut to have a break and get a chance to heal. Our gut layer is only one cell wall thick. So if you're constantly damaging it, think about how much it gets disrupted and how much it needs to self-repair. Some GABA supplements work for some people. The problem is, is that the GABA molecule itself in those cases, it won't cross through the blood brain barrier. It typically won't, it's too big of a molecule. But if you can combine it with niacin, there's a form of GABA called nicotinyl GABA. Nicotinyl GABA can cross through the blood brain barrier because it sort of piggybacks on with B3, with niacin. In which case you have a higher likelihood of that GABA getting into the brain and being able to restore GABA. Now there are shorter term things that you can do. Okay, for example, if you've ever heard of kava, there are things called kava lactones in kava. These are essentially precursors and in some ways they're actually GABAergic to begin with. The problem is, is that they can cause a depletion of GABA later on. Perfect example again, alcohol. Alcohol is very GABAergic, which means that a lot of times, like even though when you're intoxicated, you may not make the best choices because you're intoxicated, if you drink just enough to relax, you might actually have more control over your appetite because you have more GABA influence that's actually suppressing some of these neurons in your hypothalamus. That's why you might notice you have one drink, maybe you can control yourself a little bit better. The problem is, is that eventually you have a dump in GABA after that, which makes you wanna eat more later. So the best thing that you can do is consume adequate protein to get the amino acids that you need to support the neurotransmitter function. Occasionally supplement with glutamine when you are kind of going through a phase of higher intensity or more stress. And also understanding that if you can maybe influence that GABA cycle within your brain a little bit more, you might A, get more out of a GLP-1 receptor agonist, or better yet, maybe not have to utilize one. As always, keep it locked in here on my channel, and I'll see you tomorrow.